Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And welcome everybody to this session uh, of the Climate Governance Commission on our recent report just launched on November 28th in a global online launch governing our planetary emergency. Bajra, can you hold up the hard copy that just arrived today <laughs> from Washington, DC? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, we can, we can give you some upon request. Um, and of course, it's available uh, online uh, soft copy and we can share the, the link and the QR code so you can access it. So climate area, uh, the Climate Governance Commission, uh, this report is called Governing our Planetary Emergency. And I'll just, to give you some background, uh, run you through the, the sort of uh, working methods of the Climate Governance Commission and some of our key insights and proposals that we have just released this year. So, sure. Please. So the Climate Governance Commission, we are currently in high level phase with uh, ambassadors for the commission's work, including former heads of state, such as Mary Robinson of the Elders, uh, first female head of state of uh, Ireland, uh, President Johan Rockström is our co-chair uh, on the science side, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, former president of the UN General Assembly, amongst other former heads of state and thought leaders. We have three youth commissioners and others that are really helping to refine our substance and hopefully to provide some thought leadership on this topic of climate governance in these times. So what are the current gaps in climate governance? Uh, as you know, those of you who read IPCC reports, <laughs> the situation is dire. Uh, as of 2018, the IPCC was already saying, we're going to need a rapid transformation of the international economy on uh, at a speed and scale unprecedented in human history. UN Secretary General has also, you know, raised the call that we're in a code red for humanity based on uh, the latest science, uh, that we are truly in an emergency. And we at the Climate Governance Commission feel that we must, we, we will have to improve our governance mechanisms at the international level in particular, but at all levels to in order to really grapple with the climate crisis and the planetary emergency. So why are we in a planetary emergency? Many of you will probably be familiar with these uh, planetary boundaries, the planetary boundaries framework. We have overstepped six uh, of nine of these. Uh, and the latest science, even, even more recent than the last IPCC reporting, uh, shows that we have an extremely limited carbon budget if we we're going to try to stay within the 1.5 degree temperature limitation target. So we are really in unprecedented times. We're at an intersection, a crossroads, in fact, in human history, which the UN Secretary General has also emphasized. So we have to think uh, fast, <laughs> also carefully and deeply about how we can really put in place the measures to address the planetary emergency. So we released a report on 28th November, as I mentioned, uh, and we take sort of a two-track approach to the governance proposals we are offering uh, to the international community. Uh, first, near-term, one to three-year timeline, and then a bit longer or medium-term, three to five years. And we're of the view that uh, the planetary emergency is so grave that we have to also look at these deeper architectural reforms at the same time as we do these urgent uh, governance mechanisms under uh, our current architecture. So these are our top 10 near-term proposals. I won't go through all of them. You can look at the report. We have partners uh, for most of these uh, top 10 proposals that will now work with us on implementation. And you can see a few of them we'll touch upon today. For example, catalyze business as a force for good. How can businesses be really key protagonists and how can this sort of progressive business movement really move to the mainstream? Uh, we have urgent improvement uh, of COPs, the climate COPs as our top first uh, proposal, declare a planetary emergency, convene the Secretary General's uh, suggested emergency plat platform for planetary emergency, et cetera. So I'll let you, you know, browse those in the report as you wish. And then our next generation government's uh, proposals, uh, you see them here are top five. And the Global Environment Agency proposal, for example, this has something that has been proposed by scientists for decades, uh, and also heads of state of, of uh, France and Germany proposed this as early as 20, uh, 2009. 
So these are some of these are not new ideas, but they're becoming really increasingly pressing that we seriously look at these and and really develop uh, the plans uh, for these. And and we're planning high level expert meetings over the coming year to develop uh, and, and to work with partners really to to push for these transformations. So. On the second panel in particular that we have today, we'll be talking about advocacy and youth engagement. Uh, we have a theory of change, so to speak. We know that norm entrepreneurship of uh, people like the elders founded by Nelson Mandela, we know the power of good ideas <laughs> and a vision. And, and we're at a time where we need this visionary thinking. Um, also, we uh, about effective communication, education, transformative education, and uh, the time of youth movements and smart coalition that are that are global civil society and like-minded states that have been very very powerful in making really big international shifts. So we'll talk about that on our second panel. So yeah, these are some key up, upcoming events, and um, we'll hear more about this in our second panel. And look forward to working with any of you on any of this. Uh, I think I shall stop there and move to our first panel. Leia, if you could come up and join us. So we're very fortunate to have uh, some amazing speakers here today on our first panel. Uh, we're just waiting for our commissioner from China, Ma Jun, who's the director of Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs in Beijing, who should be joining us. But at the moment, we have Clea Casca Cook who's the Director of Partnerships and Stakeholder Engagement uh, and a member of the Extended Leadership Group at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, speaking about the corporate piece. We have uh, Gavin McCormick, who's a co-founder at Climate Trace, and he's going to tell us about this incredible tool today. And then Badra Kanaya, who's the CEO of Sunways Global, who's this incredible entrepreneur, innovator in solar power, uh, uh, champion for village energy empowerment. <laughs> so again, on the business side, leading the way with solutions and, and scaling up the solutions uh, at a faster pace. So Clea, let's start with you. Uh, I was at this wonderful uh, round table at the WBCSD a few days ago uh, in relation to your new CEO guide uh, uh, for the Climate Related Corporate Performance and Accountability System, CPAS. <laughs> So if you could share, uh, you know, why there is a need for such a guide, uh, what is it hoping to achieve, what is the current accountability landscape for companies, and uh, what are sort of the push and pull factors and the blockers for greater corporate accountability for climate and planetary boundary uh, reporting, but also sort of transformations needed to stay within planetary boundaries. Over to you. Thank, thank you, and thank you for having me here. So I represent the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We have over 220 company members. We're a nonprofit CEO-led organization. And we, this year at COP, we have a significant presence. Our lots of colleagues, we've all been running around in different sessions. And one of our main focus areas is around the space of corporate performance and accountability. And thus we launched CPAS. Our CEO says, wherever you go, mention CPAS. And we're really proud and happy to do so. So very happy to be here. It's also the year of the global stock take. And not only have governments not done enough, and not met their obligations, but businesses also have not. And our role, and a little bit as a critical friend to companies, is also be to have conversations with them about that and to work together on solutions. So it's less about just saying there's a problem and we others need to do the following X, Y, Z. And by the way, congratulations on your work. I have a summary and I have the slides and I'm looking forward to reading it once there's a bit more time. So businesses have a key, key role to play. And what we one of the big focus areas of CPAS in a nutshell is that the current financial system and the way companies are evaluated does not take into account the way the carbon closure system. And that basically there's currently a misalignment between corporate sustainability efforts and corporate valuation, speaking very Practically, I have colleagues that are very technical experts like Fiona and many others and can really go into the detail. But I think overarchingly, 
that's what I would talk about CPAS. There is this misalignment and what we have done, and we have not done this alone, but we work together with civil society, academia, different governance representatives, which is why I also really like this effort because you need really diverse people with different perspectives to come together. We've held a series of consultations. This also builds on other work that we already are doing and launching in WBCSD and also implementing. We're really about action, mm. like around scope three emissions, etc. And it's a framework a guide for CEOs on how to improve basically their carbon performance and also their carbon performance reporting system. I can go into more details about it and can share a few more highlights, but just from an overview perspective, I think that's already quite helpful. And I can also talk later on a bit more about some of the big issue, the key frameworks, incentives, regulation, but also the importance of collaboration in this space. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll just have one little follow-up question now, and then maybe we can come go deeper in questions if, if people in the audience have questions. But on the government policy side, do you have any ideas about, you know, key policies that governance should be passing around the world to really you know, up up the game of, of companies or how do you view that? And then also uh, on the other side, in terms of uh, a corporate green lobby, what do you think, is there a potential to build this at the international level? The B team was helpful, you know, negotiating the Paris Agreement in 2015. We were working with Exponential Roadmap Initiative and they managed to mobilize uh, Swedish companies worth 20% of Swedish GDP in advance of last election to advocate for, for good, strong climate uh, legislation. So sort of just quick thoughts on those two uh, points. Complex questions. I'll answer very much from also my perspective and experience and also what we've done at WBCSD. On the policy side, well, we, we obviously, and let's be practical, we also need policies on the local level. And I really like that you pointed out the role of cities. Cities are going to be playing a key role in this and the national level. That's a lot about the incentive system work. But one thing policies are, companies are increasingly asking for linked to a level playing field mm -hmm. is more alignment, just more transparency and more alignment around different regulations, because often they're very willing, especially the leaders, which speaks to your green lobby yes. about aiming higher and doing better. Yes. Because it's the right, but also this buyer interest, customer interest, especially mm -hmm. employee interest. You want to attract the right talent, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there's a there's so much confusion on all these different reporting mechanisms, rules, legislation, right. not always clarity. And as we work in global markets, and also notice the focus you have on the global trading system, and embedding sustainability in that and also taking a systems lens on these issues. It's not always black or white. Mm -hmm. Some countries or regions like Africa are actually quite concerned about some of the environmental initiatives coming out of Europe as well-meaning as they are and also positively impactful. We need to be thinking about that. We need to involve companies in those discussions. But practically speaking, I would say more, less is more, <laughs> have a few fewer and that's where C plus comes in, that provides clarity and simplicity. There's so many companies spend so many hours, especially smaller companies mm -hmm. that have less resources, just on reporting and meeting. And when I was in the private sector before, I spent hours filling out questionnaires. Yeah. I mean, that's not the best time spent. We should be on the ground trying to improve the way machines run or you know, working with local communities on key issues, not filling out even more questionnaires. So the more we can use technology, the more we can simplify things, innovate with each other, that's a key thing, where we also come in and just create a bit more alignment. It would be very helpful. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Excellent points. And I love the innovation in sort of policy standards. And that's a, really a key theme in our report, governance innovation. We need that innovation uh, mindset to achieve the goals. Thank you so much. Let's turn to Majun next. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you in a moment your work uh, with companies in, in the Chinese context in, in particular. But first, I wanted to ask you about the intergovernmental uh, dynamic, if you have thoughts. So one of our top 10 uh, uh, recommendations Number three is proposing this sort of grand bargain uh, uh, amongst the top four international emitters, including China, US, EU, and India. 
you know, to show leadership, powerful actors and the biggest admitters can really work together and show the way for the rest of the world. So, of course, this is counter to some some trends that we see, but the the you know the commissioners feel like they again want to want to show this thought leadership for the good of all of humanity. So, do you see potential for such a grand bargain? Uh, what could be points of uniting? What are key areas to work together, or and what might be key sticking points? Any thoughts you have, Majun? Thank you so much, and um, uh, I, I would say when it comes to intergovernmental. Uh, if I uh, state uh, the uh, try to uh, try to interpret it, our our uh, government policy is uh, you know government always support Chinese government always support uh, multilateralism you know under the UN frame UN framework for all the countries equally participate and uh, and try to come up with uh, with with a conclusion. Uh, uh, consensus, and uh, uh, we're so happy to see Paris Agreement. You know, the first stock take recognize this is so crucial. You know, with Paris Agreement, so many countries have come together. 150 of them have made their uh, carbon neutrality uh, pledge. I think this is uh, such a kind of a uh, achievement of the of the mankind. Uh, but when it comes to practical, you know, I. I'm I'm one of the member uh, commissioner of the Climate Governance Commission. Uh, we can see practically there are there are needs for some of them to take the lead because different countries are di in different conditions, different situation, different uh, development phase, and uh, uh, and 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 the responsibility is somewhat different. And uh, uh, taking China and United States as an example, these two countries put together um, have uh, about. Uh, uh, Forty percent of the global total emission. So just think about that. Uh, if they don't come together, if we don't come together uh, to to try to uh, uh, work out some uh, so something uh, together, then it's very hard for the rest of the world to really do it without this big elephant there. So, uh, so it's so uh, important for China and U.S. You know to. Uh, signed the uh, Sunny Sunnyland uh, agreement, you know, uh, statement this time. I think it's so so crucial on things like methane. Mm. Uh, without that, uh, it, it, it will be quite difficult to do. And uh, of course, uh, energy transition and all of this uh, issues. Uh, so I think that's already uh, demonstrate how important it is for uh, some of the bigger countries with uh, bigger responsibilities uh, to uh, to, uh, to come out and try to, uh, to really show the responsibility. And with India, you know, India's uh, and the China, India, both 1.4 billion uh, people and put together, just think about that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big proportion of the global population and, uh, and we're growing so fast. So, so it's, uh, it's also important to have India and uh, Europe Europe has always be the top bearer, the leader, and um, um, uh, EU is uh, is also very crucial. So, so I, I hope that uh, this is not uh, by this is by no means try to uh, undermine the multilateralism, uh, the uh, framework, uh, but just uh, try to try to be the leader. Uh, that's that's my point. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. And also in terms of you know large actors, uh, can you say a little bit about your work with big multinational companies in China, in particular, transparency, emissions tracking, uh, tracking, and uh, uh, what are some other supports we need to really scale up uh, decarbonization across supply chains, etc. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we see eye to eye on yeah, a lot of things. Uh, you're you're making all these rules globally, overarching rules, and uh, we're the ones on the ground. Yeah, in China, uh, from Paris to Glasgow, and now today to Dubai, so many companies have made their net zero commitment uh, because they know, as the big ones, they have their responsibility. They know that uh, their their assets put together is just uh, mind boggling. Yeah. But how many of them in reality have put their words into action? The day the slogan is about, you know, th this time we saw everywhere, unite, we need to unite, we need to act, but we also need to deliver. But you mentioned about scope three and uh, 
uh, bulk of their carbon footprint are usually often in the scope three in the supply chain and uh, as the largest factory of the world at this moment so we're still doing a lot of uh, carrying a lot of scopes three the embedded carbons being exported all over and um, uh, so how how could we work together to expand, help them you know translate this worse into action they probably still many of them sit in the office of uh, uh, New York, to Paris, to London, you know, they made those decisions. But in, in their bill, probably China is still a black hole of, uh, of, of data. Uh, there's no kind of no way to penetrate, uh, to really go green in China. No, it's not like that. You know, we've been 16, 17 years ago, set up our Blue Map app, Blue App database, Blue Map database. And uh, through all these years, we witnessed historic progress made in China's environmental transparency. And uh, uh, just one parameter, we started with 2,000 records of violations, penalty fines of those companies failing the standard. Today, that number have topped us 3 million. And many of those, you know, we're tracking 14 million companies' environmental performance and color code them based on their performance. And uh, some of the largest the banks in China tap into the data. We help them to run through 1 million companies who want to borrow money as part of the green banking policy requirements for due diligence. And uh, on the supply chain side, increasingly, you know, one by one, the, but before they sign contract, they compare their list with our list. And now there's a digital solution. Whenever there's a new kind of uh, uh, issues, negative, positive, they, they're, they're on the ground. We say on the ground in the factory, the factory owners or the uh, supply chain managers got a push notification in their inbox or on their cell phone. And through a kind of agreement, uh, uh, within 10 days, they make disclosure about what went wrong, how they try to solve the problem. And then we also create digital accounting, carbon accounting platform, so that because if we want to really implement the net zero policy, the science-based target, then it's all started from measuring and disclosure. But measuring could be quite costly, you know, Immediately, they pay some tens of thousands of dollars only just for making some basic measuring before they even sign on that. So I, what we help them is to create a digital solution you know, on the measuring and disclosure and performance reveal. It's all been digitalized. And now we're trying to, the target setting process also, let's digitize that. Mm -hmm. If we really, if we are really serious about science-based target, yeah. we can allow this chunky process to stop all these companies uh, who want to uh, be part of that. So, so I think this is uh, uh, what's going on. I just want to say, you know, in China, there are a situation that can, you know, we are open to uh, work together where, you know, China's more ready than many think to, uh, for, to collaborate. And, uh, and this shouldn't be an excuse by any multinational companies uh, who kind of claim that the, in China, we don't know what's going on. No, it's not like that. Go to our website, you will see, you know, every hour about air, water, coast, you know, all this uh, uh, and, and region by region, the carbon footprint, the carbon emission and corporations on the facility level. So many of them made their uh, disclosure already. Thank you. It's incredible. Thank you so much for telling us about that. <laughs> really incredible work. So exciting. So on the, the the issue of data gaps, that's a perfect segue to Gavin's presentation of the Climate Trace Project. So Gavin, you have a few slides and here you go. Over to you. Thank you so much. And I would love to talk to you after the presentation, maybe. Um, okay, thank you. Brilliant. Um, so I represent Climate Trace. We're a coalition of 100 different groups of universities, NGOs, researchers working together to try to make global emissions data transparent. I completely agree that there is often a myth that emissions are somehow unknowable. And uh, we think that over the last year, we have been able to get to a pretty good, close global map of the largest sources of emissions worldwide. So we released on Sunday morning 350 million facilities worldwide the estimated emissions of, uh, it's about 60% of climate change. We've tracked it to an individual facility and we have an estimate of the emissions, the size of the facility, how often that facility is turned on and what level it's operating at. 
who it is owned by, some uncertainty estimates. It's imperfect. What we can see from space is never going to be the same quality as what you can get in high quality reporting. But the difference is that no one can hide. So we've released this to the public. It's all open source and free. Like Wikipedia, many authors teamed up. So I have a day job. I work for wattime.org. And we are one of the many, many organizations that together built Climate Trace. So everyone can have it. And it's you. Yes. And so um, working together, we were able to paint this picture. I just wanted to give you an example of here we are in the UAE. So I picked a country just because we are here on the ground. This is the source. Anyone can go to climatetrace.org and see the emissions estimates. A lot of people driving here or taking the metro might have seen a flaring going on at a local refinery. So you'll see that in the database. You might have flown in on the world's largest airport. So its emissions estimates include us in this room right here, right now, our results. Um, just wanted to give you a sense. So then we um, add up the type of facility by country. So I think I picked here Malawi as an example, just to give you a sense that from a governance perspective, here we are at the global stock take. More than 77 countries haven't actually provided any emissions data to UNFCCC since before the Paris Agreement was signed. So we actually have no independent reporting from these countries on have they done anything. But it's not like the NGO community hasn't done something before, but we wanted to provide, here's the best consensus estimate of what, uh, what does this add up to in terms of different sectors for any country. And uh, we really avoided a global north bias. So it's truly any country in the world. There's no higher quality data in some countries and others, none of that. Um, so we added up to a global assessment uh, at climatetrace.org that anyone can see the facilities. And if you could use data to reduce emissions, we would love to work with you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and Gavin, just a question for you. You've already answered it in part, but for example, I can see this as an incredible accountability tool, obviously, just generally. And, you know, one of our... fair and ambitious requirements under the Paris Agreement, as some countries and regions have done with independent science uh, councils. So this would be like an amazing resource for them. Any other ideas about the accountability or current governance, uh, future governance interface, if you have them? I guess one thing I would say is that I think the value of independent science is often that um, we've seen many cases where countries are missing emissions data, and it was entirely well-meaning. Mm -hmm. I think something that we miss is how it's really hard to measure emissions precisely. And so I think the value of an independent committee like that, that says, we've gathered what everyone knows and we're offering it to help countries be accountable. The accountability sometimes can turn into a um, sort of an angry narrative. And I've come to believe that a lot more emissions reductions are possible than people think. Amazing, uh, excellent insight, um, fantastic. <laughs> Look forward to speaking further as things unfold in terms of our implementation of proposals. So moving next to Badra. So uh, you have this incredible company doing this incredible work with uh, last mile connectivity for distributed renewable energy, in particular focus on solar. So if you could just tell us about Sunways Global, its philosophy, how you came into doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, Maya, congratulations for amazing government uh, report, uh, and I love it. Uh, coming back on the philosophy, we've seen that, you know, the uh, when we are growing in terms of renewable energy, we have this large gigawatt scale clubs the huge centralized renewable energy project. When we see this large centralized renewable energy project, these big projects are not solving the last mile connectivity problem. You've seen a lot of villages, a lot of villages and the cities and the small towns are not able to get energy access. So, so during the peak time, what happened that, you know, the most of the energy is picked by the industries, commercial city towns because they pay higher tariff. And we've seen that these last mile connectivity, residual energy was not able to done gone to the village. So this was a peculiar problem. For the last 20 years, we have like gigawatts of uh, deployment, but still they don't have energy access. So we picked the problem and we said that we need to solve this problem. You need to have innovators and probably a small agile platform would be able to solve that, not the big guys. So last mile connectivity problem, we said that decentralized renewable energy, where you don't need to build a large gigawatt scale renewable energy project and, and transmit across 400 miles and 300 miles and get into the consumer. We said, let's build a a small renewable energy project close to the city, close to the town. So within 15 miles, your generation, transmission, distribution, and consumption is done. You are typically, you know, reducing the stability of the grid. You are able to reduce the transmission losses. So we built that project. It was extremely difficult. So the philosophy was to uh, able to solve that problem of energy access. A lot of the emerging market where we seen that this village is, because they don't get the same electricity because during the daytime, peak time, industry and everybody takes the electricity come in the night. 
the problem starts they go to the farm in the night agriculture is extremely difficult the 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 medical store the school in the village is not absolutely working we said we need to solve this problem and that's where the sunwish genesis was built and we said let's start pushing the government to get the right policy where we always discuss that the climate governance council or the policy advocacy is extremely important to get the government get moving and get the right policy we worked very hard in last 2 3 years we were extremely working and today we've got about 100 megawatt of renewable energy operational assets we have changed the 50000 households got daytime electricity half a million of people has got impacted more than 100 villages is getting a daytime electricity now just imagine that kind of a energy access we'll able to solve with that kind of an innovative model now the country like india we've seen that large energy deployment they were able to mature the local debt, debt market they were able to get that currency risk right we were able to scale that technologies all there we've got a higher irradiation so at the sunways we believe that you know uh, sometime what she said more is just more you're not able to solve the problem but to solve that last mile connectivity problem the innovative way of deploying your energy resources the way you deploy we are not mm-hmm. saying that this technology but the way we could able to mobilize the resources at a such a ground level it works fantastically you know and we are able to solve that so i think that's what the genesis of a sunways is and continue to build a gigawatt scale now we see in india and most of the other countries we've seen the 25 gigawatt of dre tenders are coming you need someone to push and do and demonstrate that this 15 project work absolutely fine able to work within the ecosystem you're able to create a financial product we are not a non profit we are for a profit but we with the impact we don't want to build a gigawatt scale 10 gigawatt renewable energy company which doesn't know that where the energy is going and there is absolutely no clue what kind of a measured how do you impact we said we know exactly this is the 50000 houses where the energy is going we know exactly that these guys are able to get a daytime so it's a measured and quantifiable impact we would be a profitable and i see that a renewable energy or a climate if you're not able to get that a profitability or the corporates to come in grant cannot take us to the level we want to do it we need to have that commercial angle to move from entrepreneurs on the ecosystem like what we have built to be able to successfully raise a couple of round of capital the venture capital the private equity fund amount of the money which is available for the organization like us who are able to do and demonstrate and running project is far more phenomenal in today's and we are living in the world where the transition happening like a lot of entrepreneurs so you know there is an amazing opportunity to build such an innovative product which can hugely scale not in the one country but across the geography where you see see the same problem so this is what you know at a sunways we are building <laughs> superb excellent and and you know the, the work of sunways and your partners show you know the role of business private sector the transformative role it can be principles based but then sustainable financially sustainable also the policy piece you spend a lot of time sort of working with policy makers educating those uh, on the energy transition and you're increasingly talking to governments around the world also you're really in demand so let's take a few questions we have a bit of time for a few questions if if anyone has questions before we move to the next panel yes go ahead is a maybe we should share the microphone sorry okay yeah okay hey um hello i just have the question for you um i'm fully agree with the idea of decentralized energy renewable energy supply but the question is do you think about how does the maintenance cost or how you fix the problem in the future if like um if something is broken or you know the small household how can you deliver the service for the long term i think uh, this is a very important question when you build a small plant always a question of challenge of a maintenance typically when we build the project which is a not gigawatt scale we build a 10 15 10 15 megawatt 5 7 megawatt tens of project key of the maintenance that you build that ecosystem so like emerging market like india you have a amazing in, uh, infrastructure in the maintenance ecosystem where you could able to maintain that project not only your project but the transmission infrastructure also we will able to do it so uh, at a sunways we build in house capabilities or the organization like us who does the in house operation and maintenance of the across the project when you have a scale of a 20 30 40 50 project across the 500 kilometers you're able to uh, maintain that project of the quality great yeah one more question lots of questions all really good but it's for Gavin because I went to your plenary with Al Gore the other day and I've been thinking about something ever since and it's you know the reliability of the data really and you know because I could see weather affecting it wind rain um 
how often there's a flyover, output of the plant, all these sorts of things, right? But I, and I know you said that the metadata captures some of the of that information, but you know, how do you see that, and and really, how should we really think about it when we're using the data? Thank you so much for asking. So the short version is that um, when you look at any particular facility on the site, uh, in uh, if you look at like for example card, um, it will say here are the emissions, and there will be an estimate of our confidence. So it's just a scale from green to red. Uh, scientists are happy to go and look at the actual uncertainty metrics with all the sigmas and everything. But um, uh, basically, there are things we feel like we are confident of that our algorithms are less affected by weather. For example, we were able to measure it six different ways. There are things that we have an estimate. We wanted to put the estimate out there, but we think you should you know keep in mind that it's just an estimate. And uh, on the website, we sort of show here are the ones that are high confidence, here are the ones that are low confidence. One of the things that's been most interesting to me, most often from a physical remote sensing uh, perspective, it's a mix. So I like the example of ships. We have an extremely good count of how many ships they are, exactly how many nautical miles they went. We nailed that. Are we exactly sure of what's the energy efficiency of a particular ship? So it's high confidence for some things and low confidence for other things. And so on the website, you can go in there and you can see, here's our high and low confidence for emissions. But if you want to kind of get into it and figure out like, what do we really know and what do we not know? We tried to also say, here are the parts of the problem we really have high confidence about. Here are the parts we have low confidence. Um, because also that helps uh, people who have a better idea say, this is where I could help you improve. Great. I just want to weigh in a little bit. And because, uh, you know, just as we said that uh, maybe from the air to the on the ground, maybe we can pair together, you know, in China, 80,000 of the, some of the largest emitters have, uh, have uh, uh, installed online monitoring and required every hour to monitor their, you know, so far not carbon, but, uh, but it's, uh, you know, sulfur and, uh, and, and nitrogen and uh, particles, and they need to every hour report those data, uh, uh, not just to the regulators. We push them to, to open that to the public. And uh, so think about that. This is in the future, you know, when all this monitoring uh, aligned with, uh, with, with the uh, internet of things. And um, so maybe on the carbon side, uh, on the, um, uh, methane side, you know, there are possibilities as well. So I think to go with uh, together with uh, uh, climate trees and uh, if we have something, you know, no one can hide uh, from the air, remote sensing, and then on the ground. So let's motivate them to do that. So that's why I think it's so important for all of us to raise questions to those multinationals sourcing in a massive way globally. If they have a policy, yeah. If they have a policy, they can require for, for for a voluntary disclosure by those companies, and we have digital solutions to make that happen in a cost-effective way. So let's try to try to you know push this from both end, and eventually, I think we could move toward something a real transparent global map that uh, mapping system that. Wherever they're moving, we can take them down and in a much more higher quality, I hope, data. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, um, uh, Gavin, I think say I had a, a point to make. Just that's a very brief point as I'm listening and just to build on your points and on the report and the findings. One thing that has not been mentioned about yet, at least I haven't seen it called out, is the importance of, in a way, translating some of these recommendations and making them logical and implementable on the local level, especially to communities, I would say in Europe, in North America and Australia, we're seeing a big issue on equity, social unrest, and in an increasingly multipolar crisis-ridden world. And conversations around having, for example, a global environmental organization, while it might appeal very um, very much to people like us that work in this space, anything that on a local level where people could start feeling more disenfranchised, things being taken away, their local community not being considered, or the local impact, so they want to have a voice in what happens locally, but actually appeal quite unsettling. I saw this when I was living in the United States as a student and worked on issues regarding the International Criminal Court and the ICTY. It's very different, but there are similarities. So it's just something to anticipate and to be careful about, that this is not a group of global elites 
and environmentalists coming up with this big global supranational organization that is going to dictate life on the local level. This could generate uncertainty. So it's just something I wanted to flag because I think what the recommendations are so amazing. So this local impact, the local solutions are so important. And so helpful. Yes, ab absolutely. And uh, in part two of the report and also part five and six, we talk about indeed what should be the principles of this international governance, how does it connect to all the layers of governance, and also issues of equity, inclusion, also communications, governmental crisis communications, but also information ecosystems. And the economic piece is so important. And this was emphasized by our commissioners again and again and again. We're working with the Club of Rome uh, on their Earth for All proposal, which has been so popular also with you know, populations in Europe and, and elsewhere. That and, and our Brazilian commissioner has so emphasized the need for um, economic inclusion is is and we're we're so behind on SDGs, for example. So this is really holistically part uh, of, of, of the vision that we and the commissioners have come up with and we have to really uh, take seriously, but also on the media and communication side. And we have a number of uh, proposals on, on that, that uh, front and there's so much more uh, we, we need to do. So very well taken points. Excellent report. <laughs> Excellent work. So I say it with full admiration and care about ensuring the long-term success. Yeah, perfect. Okay. In the interest of time, let's thank these amazing panelists. Thank you so much. And let's bring up our next set of panelists focusing on youth and advocacy. Thanks so much. Great. So moving to our second panel on the very important uh, topic of youth and advocacy. Obviously, uh, all of these proposals of, of the Commission will not see the light of day unless we have really good advocacy, public outreach, and strategies to, to find implementation pathways. Um, so uh, I'm so pleased to have with us here today, uh, uh, firstly, Mert Kumru. On the end, a core team member at the World's Youth for Climate Justice. Next, Aritra Chakrabarti uh, from the Young Scholars Network at the Institute of New Economic Thinking, or INET. We have um, honorary youth, John Vlasto, <laughs> at the Mobilizing and Earth Governance Alliance and chair of the World Federalist Movement Institute of Global Policy. Uh, we have Veena. Balakrishnan, who's a founder of the Youth Negotiators Academy, Climate Youth Negotiators Program, and uh, Joseph Hammond, who's the Africa Director, Faith for Our Planet, um, AU IDOV Fellow, and I think Youth uh, Emissary or something like this. Perfect. <laughs> so we have a brilliant uh, panel. 
Let's start first with Mert. Um, and first, it would be great if you could tell us about the World Youth for Climate Justice campaign, the origin, purpose, and the state of your campaign. What are you trying to do? Thank you, Maya. A little bit too loud. Um, so World Youth for Climate Justice is an organization that is trying to seek climate justice at the highest international level. And this level is the International Court of Justice in The Hague. You might know it um, as the Peace Palace. Um, and how exactly are we trying to achieve this? Well, through an international tool called an advisory opinion. You might have heard about uh, Vanuatu seeking to get such an advisory opinion earlier this year. Well, that started all out because of young people in the Pacific. Um, it was 25, 27 law students, I must say, um, at the University of the South Pacific um, in Vanuatu that had a law class. And during that law class, they um, were getting insights on how to use the law in your benefit. And they just said, well, why don't we just go and do it? Why don't we use this final tool uh, within the international law toolbox, so to say, and go seek climate justice? Uh, and they started out four years ago, uh, yeah, four years ago. And right now we are at a very special position because never before had the International Court of Justice spoken about climate change. And we have a unanimous support for the, you know, as ICJ advisory opinion, 132 states voted in favor um, in March of this year. Zero votes against. I mean, obviously there were some abstentions. The usual suspects did not like to vote in favor. I'm not pointing any fingers, but it still goes to show that that many countries were very much in favor of such an approach and um, very much that, that, that the entire atmosphere globally right now is being set to get an advisory opinion that's going to explain what the obligations are of states under the Paris Agreement. Because a lot of people don't know what an advisory opinion is. It's basically an advice from the highest court, which explains what states should do or shouldn't do in order to achieve the Paris Agreement. And we make the nexus between climate change and human rights by basically saying that the climate crisis also um, constitutes to a human rights crisis. Therefore, the court is the perfect medium uh, and the perfect authority to explain what the consequences should be and how we can prevent uh, human rights uh, violations from happening in the future. So that's in a nutshell, the campaign. Thank you so much. And your campaign has really been wildly successful. Uh, and, and youth around the world in different national jurisdictions have also been really successful in, in bringing cases. What do you think are the key factors? What advice would you have to other campaigns that are trying to you know, have these transformative legal shifts? Yeah, so basically it's two-sided, I would say. First of all, um, the idea of the campaign was to make sure that it's a global campaign. So the Pacific Island students fighting climate change were the ones who started out. And then they quickly said, we need to make sure that the global youth can can stand behind this. So then that's when World Street for Climate Justice came to exist. So we were basically, we're both sister organizations, we always like to call it, because we have Mother Earth, so in that sense. Um, and for moment one, we basically have se several fronts all across the world. So we are on all continents, uh, not yet on Antarctica, but we're planning on soon. Um, jokes aside. But the idea is to get young people from all of these continents at the same place, at the same time, at the court, to hear and tell their stories. Because um, a lot of these procedures are never uh, inclusive generation-wise. Uh, they're never actually inclusive from from um, fr from any point of view. Because usually countries uh, hire a certain law firm from a certain country, which are mostly Western countries. Uh, the story as you statements are usually already provided by government officials and we're trying to say well that's good and all but we need to have young people at the court talking speaking to those judges we need to have young people outside we need to have those stories to collect and that's why we're here at COP, for example to to get countries um to send in submissions because right now we're in a special phase um we have to vote so the court is already going to send going to render an advisory opinion but every single state at the UN has the right to send in their own submission and their own views on what the court has to say and what the court should say. And that is right now what we're trying to lobby for. We're trying to, uh, through our own Youth Climate Justice Handbook, which we work together with, for example, the, the Seven Center um, from Columbia Law School. With that handbook, we're trying to explain what countries should include in their submissions to allow for uh, climate justice to take place. 
And the end goal is obviously that with an advisor opinion, which is non-binding yet, to uh, take action in national courts and make sure that we have binding consequences for uh, climate, yeah, climate crisis-related um, effects. Thank yes. you, Mert, and congratulations on this excellent work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's turn next then to uh, Aritra. And uh, could you first tell us a little bit about the uh, Young Scholars Network, uh, of which you're a part of the Institute of New Economic Thinking? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on this panel. And again, congratulations on this report. I haven't gone through it yet. I was still uh, digesting all the information with everything else happening around. Um, so the Institute of New Economic Thinking is one of the oldest organizations working with the youth the irony in the statement um and and the way we engage with the youth is we we have one of the uh, oldest organizations which is spread across the world where we have these regional chapters which engages and reaches out to the most uh, deserving and uh, curious families across the globe who want to engage with the kind of work they have and the diversity of work we have it's just amazing it's not just economics it goes as far as ecology engineering uh, biology and the interdisciplinary nature of the way we collaborate is just mind boggling when we talk of interdisciplinary in these platforms and when you actually see it that happening among youth scholars it's very very different the way we talk interdisciplinary and the way young scholars think of interdisciplinary uh, it's very different um, and to add to that i'll say that uh, again, uh, from the last discussion when we were taking, uh, talking of data transparency and we saw one of those examples, I feel the youth today has a lot of information to deal with. Like Even here, the amount of information is just mind-boggling and yet our minds are not exploding uh, so far. So the, And when I see, when I uh, look at kids in the classroom when I teach, I see that they have a lot of information, but they don't know how to express their opinions through it. And why INET is one of those platforms which gives you the the kind of the the, uh, the platform or the space where you know how to translate the information into something that at least matches with advocacy that can lead to okay this is what information is this is how it translates into advocacy that's what INET has been doing for a long time so yeah excellent and from your perspective from the perspective of of the other uh, young scholars in, in the network uh, do you see this compelling need for transformation in the international financial s system the international financial institutions what is your perspective on that or that of your peers are you ready for transformation and and these big institutional shifts and are you are talking about it amongst yourselves in the network no, absolutely and again these these questions are asked and these questions are um answered in various forms. So uh, again, I'll pile on, I'll write on a statement from the previous panel where less is more. And the reason I, I, I will go with that statement is, although this report is about a global governance report, but each one of us, when we look at something that is global, we look at it from a regional perspective. For example, I will look at it from a South Asia perspective. Even more specific, I will look at this report from an India perspective. Even more specific, I will look at it from my uh, my locality perspective. What I'm trying to say it, no matter how global the 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 consensus may be, how global the information may be, it is ultimately at the regional level where the effect translates, where the policy translates, where the the action actually happens, and that is where I see uh, where I see the engagement of the youth where the need for the youth in reports like this, for them to understand, okay, this is what the report says. This is how I understand the report in my locality. And which is why I always push for uh, the bottom-up approach. Decentralization, again, decentralization is not just something where you downscale technology, where, but it also as a theme translates to downscaling the report, downscaling the policy at the local level. A national policy can have different meanings across different states. Mm -hmm. So, which is why I always, uh, in my research, I also deal with how people can adopt regional-based out, uh, regional-based policy outcomes when it comes to climate change. So that's my take on Great. the report. Fantastic. And we, we absolutely talk about that in the report. How do we connect the various layers of governance? They shouldn't be intention or adversarial. They should be working together to have the ingenuity, the local circumstances, generate the creativity, and of course, the implementation at all levels. So very uh, points very well taken. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Let's move to John Vlasto next uh, on Mobilizing an Earth Governance Alliance or MEGA, the MEGA campaign, uh, and also about the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. So firstly, John, can you just explain to us uh, how instrumental your organization was in the campaign to establish the International Criminal Court and uh, why you think there's a need for a similar campaign for global environmental governance? Thank you, Maya. I would like to start by uh, saying what a privilege it is to serve on a, a youth panel and to bring a little bit of age diversity to that. So, um, okay, so the Climate Governance Commission report is obviously a magnificent piece of work, but the report itself isn't going to change the world. You know, a, a piece of paper is, isn't, it, something needs to be done with it. What do we do with the report? And that's where the World Federalist Movement comes in. So, the World Federalist Movement. Thank you. Uh, was formed after the Second World War, after the use of nuclear weapons, um, to say that the United Nations, as it was then constituted in 1947, was not going to work to stop war, which is what it was set up for. There was a veto put in right at the beginning, uh, and it just wasn't uh, a body that was going to be empowered to make decisions for the common good. Um, unfortunately, that observation in 1947 is evidently true today. We have active wars going on today. So it's, a, it's a, unfortunately a statement that has aged well. So what the World Federalist Movement wanted to do from the outset was create legitimate, empowered global governance. And you know there were lots of supporters at the time, Churchill and Truman and Einstein. It was an obvious idea with nuclear weapons. You need global governance that's legitimate, accountable, empowered. And if we had it, we wouldn't obviously be where we are today. So the World Federalist Movement has failed to create such governance. Obviously, humanity has failed to create such governance. That's why we're in such a mess. But we have had some success. So Maya mentioned the International Criminal Court. So this was an idea from the 1990s to create the International Criminal Court. And it was done through creating a coalition of civil society and like-minded nation states to get the Rome Statute signed off and to create the court. Now, is the International Criminal Court a perfect institution? Of course not. But it is an innovation in international law and human rights. It is an innovation in global governance. It is possible to reform global governance, and it feels like such an impossible task, but it happens. So what the World Federalist Movement is going to do, working with the Climate Governance Commission and with partners in the US, Citizens for Global Solutions, is to work on creating one of these smart coalitions. And these smart coalitions were written up in a Stimson paper in 2015. International Criminal Court is one example of where they've been effective. Landmine Span Treaty is another. So such, such developments are possible. And we're planning to do this with the recommendations of the report to actually get traction, to actually impact the world. So in terms of finding like-minded countries, there's obviously no end of countries that are going to benefit if the re recommendations of this report are actually implemented. In fact, all of us and all countries around the world would benefit if the recommendations are implemented. However, there are people and there are countries who are perhaps insufficiently enlightened to see that at the moment. The name of the project to create these smart coalitions to get this work implemented is MEGA. MEGA stands for Mobilizing an Earth Governance Alliance. Depending on your sense of humor and political stance, it stands for Making Earth Great Again. <laughs> we soft launched MEGA here at COP off the back of the launch of the report. Uh, the focus at COP now and for the Commission is the report launch. It's just happened. That's where the focus is. Look at the report. In January, we're going to have a formal launch of MEGA. Um, for the project, the website has just gone live, uh, earthgovernance.org. That's on the flyer. I'll put some up here if anyone would like some. So that is the World Federalist Movement, the work with the Climate Governance Commission, the adoption of the approach that has worked for other reforms of global governance, and the mega project. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. Excellent. Let's move to Vina now. And can you tell us about this incredible Climate Youth Negotiator Program that you are a co-founder of, uh, what its purpose is, and uh, if you have any thoughts from the youth negotiators so far at these COP28 negotiations? 
Thank you, Maya. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Veena, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Climate Youth Negotiator Program. Um, what we are and what we do, basically, you see that we've been talking about young people needing to be at decision-making spaces, and Mert, you also mentioned that um, we see a global discourse we see our institutions and our leaders taking pictures with young people. We see young people in panels, but we don't see young people in the decision-making table. And that needs to be changed. And, and what we wanted to do was bring in that intergenerational equity in that decision-making table when it came to the climate process. So we started uh, with this convention and we wanted to go for all the three Rio, Rio conventions at some point. How we when, we when we started off, we knew that, okay, we want to build this intergenerational equity, but we had no idea how to go about it. So we started talking to a lot of the countries, trying to understand why are you not having young people as a part of the process? And we got very interesting um, insights from them. And that's how we also built the program itself, because everything that people said is a challenge. We made it into an opportunity and we designed the program based on that. So the first pillar of the program is we do capacity building. So we work with the young negotiators, we train them, we go, we give them six months of training, not just on the thematics of what is the agenda items at COP, but also the technical and the skills, the negotiation skills that they need. A very holistic um, capacity building that kind of builds them into a solid, robust negotiator. The second bit that we heard from countries is, oh, we have funding barriers. I don't have money because... Uh, I'm a small country. I have funding only for two people. And when I have only two people that I can take, I will take my minister and maybe his secretary, right? So um, then what happened is we decided to plug in that funding element into the program. The third bit is we also realized even if you're inside the negotiation space, these spaces are really not meant for people. I think not meant for human beings at all. Like it's it's just really, it's just hard to survive inside. It's People don't talk to each other like friends. There are no friends. There's no smile. Everybody's talking to each other. It's very political. You need safe space. You need to create a safe space. You need to make sure that you are a part of a community. This is a consensus-based process. If you're not able to come together, how are you going to build consensus? How are you going to get be better decisions and better negotiated outcomes? So we thought the most important part over here is to build that community. So when our negotiators go through these six months of training they're already becoming a community right now in the pro in the negotiation rooms as i was just looking at my whatsapp so inside the adaptation and finance uh, room where the negotiations are happening right now we have somebody from ILAC, uh, agn and uh, representing the aosis and and another group, all of them, CYNP, actually non-verbally communicating and really pushing for certain things. And that's the wow. kind of uh, change that we wanted to bring. How That's probably one of those ways to propel for consensus, propel consensus. The last bit is, of course, advocacy. That's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? We need to nurture that ground for intergenerational leadership. Intergenerational, so you are a part of the panel, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last year, we worked with 26 countries and we trained 50 young negotiators who were at COP27. This year, we worked with 54 countries and we have trained 120, 175 negotiators, of which 125 are here at COP28. It's really powerful. Thank you. It's This is how you shift narratives. This is how you change narratives. And we're really proud of what we've sort of uh, been able to achieve. And we see that those young people are really making a difference and we want to continue propelling the space and having more young negotiators with more countries so that we can think about climate justice at the end of the day. Brilliant. Thank you. And again, congratulations on such excellent work. So let's round out our uh, panel with Joseph. So can you first uh, start by telling us a bit about uh, your work as an AU Youth Ambassador uh, and also generally the intersection, what you see the role of faith uh, and, and faith leadership, system change, governance, innovation, and what you're seeing on the ground in your work. Yes, uh, I was a member, or still am a member, of IDOV, the Interfaith uh, Continental Working Group of the African Union, um, looking at uh, countering extremism. And increasingly, that organization has focused a lot on the nexus between climate change uh, and rise of extremism, particularly in places like the Sahel and northern Mozambique, where you have climate change bringing together conflict between herders and farmers, 
and then that leads to uh, a number of, of conflicts. Um, and that in turn has led to me becoming the African director of Faith for Our Planet. Um, and at Faith for Our Planet, so we're a global NGO. We do workshops around the world to engage faith leaders, uh, often in you know non-national languages, to engage faith leaders, um, how to get involved in the climate discussion, what the basics are to give a chance to them so that they can answer questions and inquiries that come from members of their flock and their parishioners so they're up to date on it and also to advocate to make that moral and ethical case to get involved in, in climate change. Uh, and as the Africa director, I feel I have the best job because in Africa, the mosques are full, the churches are full. If you want to do social change in Africa, including on issues like climate, faith-based is the way to go. And you know, even in many places of the world, not just in Africa, you can go to the smallest rural villages, the most isolated villages, and maybe you won't get cell phones reception every day. And maybe there isn't a cold Coca-Cola every day, but faith networks are there and are present. So it's really important to be, have the faith-based organizations. That's what we believe in as an interfaith organization, working with all faith uh, organizations and also non-faith actors that want to be involved in us in terms of our engagement with youth organizations, uh, FFOP. We do an annual workshop. This will be the second one. Uh, what month is it? Next month in uh, Duke University in North Carolina. We have brought, in the second year now, young leaders from around the world who are engaged in either the faith or the, envi uh, um, the environment space, and ideally at the nexus of those two spaces, to come to learn about some discussions and also to hopefully found new organizations, new initiatives um, to, again, uh, have faith at the center of that discussion. And we're also, this year I was at the UNGA at the, the, the UN chapel. There's actually a chapel at the United Nations Plaza. It's a very beautiful space. I hope all, all of you get a chance to go there. It's an interfaith space. And we launched another initiative, which we'll be coming out with, uh, Faith in Her, which is an academy specifically focused on women in the global south, again, at that intersection between faith um, and, and climate change, talking about the region I know best, uh, Africa. Um, you know, if you look at most African countries, the largest employer uh, in terms of the population is the agricultural sector. All right. And, you know, and where I'm from, all right, the United States, California, uh, you have a vision, your idea of a farmer. It's probably not how the farmers are in, in Africa, many parts of the world. It's women who are at the in the agricultural sector, the majority of agricultural workers directly impacted by climate change. So that's one of the things we're trying to uh, rush up with a new initiative, Faith in Her, which will not exclusively be with youth, but a big component of the women that we're trying to. And that will be in partnership with Columbia University, uh, will be focused uh, on, on youth. I also want to say something about African Union really quickly because I'm still involved there uh, with the IDEV network. Climate change is increasingly important for us. I was in Helsinki three weeks ago, um, and we are planning a new governance structure to make this an intercontinental organization, and climate change will be one of the, the key initiatives there. If either of those initiatives are of interest to you, please let me know. I, I hope we can all be friends at the end of this, as uh, my co-panelists uh, pointed out. Uh, we may not have that many opportunities this COP to make friends, but let's make this space one of them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. And Joseph, just one quick question before we turn to uh, perhaps a few questions from the audience. Uh, because of your expertise in media, communications, journalism, what do you see in the information ecosystems, media landscape in terms of climate communication, about the planetary boundaries, uh, where we're at, you know, scientifically in a, in a planetary lens uh, overstepping six to nine planetary boundaries. What are the opportunities there? Uh, what should governments being do more? What should media outlets be doing more? Just kind of your diagnosis of where we're at currently and what we should be doing. Uh, yes. And, you know, uh, this goes into my own, you know, my background as a media as journalist and, you know, my own theory of change. And I was actually speaking about this in, in Kigali at the African Union's Interfaith Dialogue. But um, really changing the narrative is, is so important and getting the media involved because, you know, uh, while the reports and a lot of initiatives here are talking about initiatives we can do, you know, internationally, making consumers make different choices. You know, you're choosing the recyclable item when you go to buy, um, you know, a drink. When you're choosing to uh, have a, a vehicle that is running on an electric battery, those are all very, very important. And it's the media that's going to drive that change. Um, and it's 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 really important. And I forgot the EU official um, who said it said it best, um, talking about what we need to do on the governance level. We know what we need to do, but how can we do it and still get reelected? Right. And that's a question where the media has to step in and play the role and say how important these changes are, because there are going to be some difficulties, but the long term benefits, it's very, very important to change that narrative uh, so that we all start making the right choices, whether in governance or as individual consumers. And that's my theory of change. How we get to the next level. Right. Thank you so much. So we have a little bit of time for any questions for the panelists. 
Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe I can restate the question just for those online. So you're asking uh, now that the opinion uh, is or the process is before the court, what kind of role does uh, this this youth platform have? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, so like I identified, we have certain phases, right? And the current phase we're in, we call it phase two. So phase one was mainly to get the majority of member states to vote in favor of the advisory opinion resolution. We got past that point. Uh, quite historically, and now we're in phase two. And phase two is mainly focusing on states and their own submissions, the written submissions. So states now have the chance to send in uh, that up until the 22nd of January, 2024. There is uh, a possibility that there will be an extension so that states could have a couple of months more to send in their submissions because um, it's a lot of work and a lot of countries have never ever uh, send in anything to the ICJ. So imagine this, right? In The Hague, we have all embassies of all members mm -hmm. of member states, and like a large portion of those countries have never participated in ICJ proceedings. So we're also helping those states with our legal memorandum and with uh, connecting them with the Vanuatu government to make sure that they can make a submission. So that's the second phase, and that second phase ends as soon as the second round of written submissions is entertained by the court. And then we have the oral phase that's phase three then we will be at the court physically present and um yeah we hope that you can see and will hear us uh, worldwide and you just won a prominent oh, yeah. award at the peace palace to yes. increase your visibility yes. further thank you that's a good point uh, in two days officially uh, we will be receiving the uh, carnegie youth peace prize for two years in a row so that, that's a, sorry that's a two-year laureate um, and uh, yeah, that's, it, it goes to show that the court knows that we're there and the judges, they do know us. Um, I hope that they're a little bit scared of us as well. In a good way, in a good way. Wonderful. Thanks so much to the panelists and thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you.